Hello. Once upon a time, I was a swimmer. I was a very good swimmer. At the age of 14, I was a Serbian youth champion in breaststroke swimming. You know, I really loved swimming. Swimming was an important part of my life, a very important hobby. But it was still just a hobby, so at the age of 15, my priorities have changed. I stopped swimming and closed that door. I focused on other things in life, like computer science. 20 years ago, I entered the beautiful world of software development, and I'm still in it. Now, I work as a head of development at NetEnt, and I lead one of the development departments. I also got married and got three wonderful kids. So, my life felt fulfilled. At least, I believe so. Because when these three wonderful kids have started swimming, I have started thinking about my own swimming. Once a week, I was sitting there at the stands watching them swimming and thinking more and more about my own swimming. I was breathing chlorine, which was like a drug for me and triggered more and more thoughts about swimming. Some months have passed, even years, and one day I decided I must start swimming again. So, after 27 years long break, I opened that door. I was swimming and I was happy, but just for a short time. Because as soon as I have started swimming, I have started thinking about all my medals, about all my competitions. Don't tell me anything, I know, it's a wrong way of thinking. Do you know what modern psychology says? Effort should be re re rewarded, not only the results. So I should have been happy just with my swimming trainings. But you know, if you were standing there at that winner stand once, you want to get it there again. Believe me, it's just the way how it goes and modern psychology does not help. So I decided to start competing again, now in my mature age, as a master swimmer. As you could notice, I am a dreamer, but I am a realistic person also. So I was aware, I'm not faster now compared to the 27 years ago. But hopefully I'm smarter. So maybe I can find some good strategy in order to achieve my goal. And the goal was to get at least one gold medal at the Swedish Championships in Master Swimming. I was thinking, master swimming market, it's market like any other market. So maybe I can apply S-curve analysis in order to see the maturity of the market. If it is still in its embryonic stage, growth, mature or aging. The same market analysis as we do in a business. Master swimming has started 15, maybe 20 years ago. At the beginning, there were just several people competing. But nowadays, it's becoming more and more popular because of other type of competitions and sports like Ironman, Swim Run. So it's a lot of things and people are swimming more and more. So we can say master swimming market, it's in its growth phase. Who are the entrants on the market? We have former swimmers. We have also former athletes. People who are doing some other type of sport, maybe running or cycling, got injured and then they turned to swimming. We have also new swimmers, people who discovered the beauty of swimming as adults. A lot of competitors, right? And I was trying to imagine how competition would look like. Something like that like swimming in a red ocean, and we are going to find against each other for the same market share, market medal, in an already competitive market. So the water in the swimming pool is going to get rid of a such a bloody competition. Do you know how is it called? It's called red ocean strategy. And many companies are doing exactly that. They're competing in existing market space, and the goal is to beat the competition, to have the best possible product, to be the best one. But 
this is really realistic for me to beat the competition, to beat all these tough iron girls who are training five times a week. You know, I don't have a possibility to train that much. I have a full-time job, three kids, one husband. I mean, so many things to take care of. I don't have a possibility to train that much. And then I was thinking, wouldn't it be nicer to swim like this dolphin in the blue water, to create uncontested market space, make the competition irrelevant, and win medals? Is it possible? What do you think? Or maybe to say, is it possible to do this jump as this fish from the fish bowl with a lot of competitors to find an empty fish bowl? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. If you apply blue ocean strategy, a business strategy proposed by two professors from INSEAD Institute, Professor René Mamborn and Chan Kim. I've applied this business strategy, blue ocean strategy, on my swimming competition, and it resulted in a literally winning concept. So here it comes, my swimming in the blue ocean story. As suggested, I started with a strategy canvas. I wanted to see how my competitors are doing. What do they think that it's important? When you create a strategy canvas, you start from defining competing factors to see what industry and other companies or competitors think that they're the most important. And then you define also offering level, if they invested in competitor factor little or much. And I have chosen the following competing factors. Training hard, freestyle distances, when you compete in freestyle distances, Short distances, meaning 500 and 100, uh, 50 and 100 meters. Middle long distances, 200 and 400 meters. Long distances, 800 and 1,500 meters. And not my best discipline means that you're competing in disciplines which are not your best discipline. So, for example, if I'm a breaststroke swimmer, that I can may maybe compete in freestyle or butterfly distances. Let's see the strategy value curve for former swimmers. It looks like this. Training hard, oh yes, they are training very hard, although they don't want to admit that. Freestyle distances, yes, they like to compete in freestyle distances because all the former swimmers are good at freestyle regarding what are their speciality because they train a lot. Short distances, they love short distances and usually they are getting a lot of medals because they still are very good in short distances. Middle long distances, not very much. Long distances, so-so, not my best discipline, so-so. Do you know why former swimmers don't invest too much in middle-long distances? It's a pure psychological reason. You know, if you were a good swimmer once upon a time, and nowadays, as a master swimmer, your time differs from your best time ever. But that difference grows exponentially when you go from short distances to middle-long distances, and then starts dropping down. And then it means that that difference in time is worse for middle long distances. And they don't want to face that fact. They don't want to accept that. So that's why it's very important that each company has psychologists and anthropologists who are analyzing your competitors' behavior and mindset. Let's see the strategy value curve for former athletes. It looks like this. Training hard, yes, maybe they're not swimming, but they are running, cycling, maybe going to gym. Freestyle distances, yes, usually they compete because usually you can just uh, crawl if you haven't trained swimming before. Short distances, yes, they're usually in good shape and they like to complete in short, uh, compete in short distances. Middle distances, not very much. For long distances, they like because usually they can manage to swim those long distances because they are in a good shape. Not my best discipline, not very much. Usually they can just crawl. Let's see strategy value curve for new swimmers. Training hard, so-so. Freestyle distances, 
Yes, usually you start with the crawl course. So when you enter the competition, usually you can just crawl. Short distances, yes, it's the easiest to swim just 50 meters. Middle long distances, no, they're not capable to swim 200 meter very <laughs> intensive or 400 meters. Neither long distances, neither not my best discipline. Usually they can just crawl. Do you see some trends here? All three strategy value curves converge in the same manner. What does it mean? It means that all these three groups are competing around the same competing factors. So if I create my strategy value curve to converge in the same manner as all my competitors' value curves, it would mean that I will end up in a red ocean, that I would compete around the same competing factors as they do. And probably I will not have a chance for a medal. It is said that every good strategy has three important elements. Focus, compelling tagline, as Apple has think different, and divergence. Because if you want to find your blue ocean to do something differently, your value curve has to diverge from all other value curves. But how you can introduce that divergence in your strategy value curve? By applying something that is called for action framework. You go through all competing factors, and for each one you decide if you should eliminate that factor, reduce, raise, or create something new. Let's see how I did. So coming back to that strategy canvas. I started from the first competing factor, training hard. As I said, I don't have a possibility to train hard. Three children, one husband, so on. I will reduce this factor. Freestyle distances, everyone is investing in freestyle distances. I will eliminate that totally from my strategy. The same goes for short distances. But middle long distances, look at this beauty. No one is investing in middle long distances. I will raise that factor. And also, I will create a new mindset that even if I'm a breaststroke swimmer, I can compete in some other disciplines. And you know, it's a very tough decision from a psychological point of view for one breaststroke swimmer, but I decided to do that for the sake of the good strategy. Let's see what I got. Here is my strategy value curve. And you see, it diverges from all other value curves, from my competitors' value curves. I got even a compelling tagline, swimming in the blue ocean. But if I don't swim my breaststroke distances, which distances should I swim? I've tried to find the sweet spot on the market, things that exist on the market, but no one is investing in that. Usually the sweet spot is something here that uh, Customer is in need for that, competitors are not offering, and you as a company has the capability to do that. For this competition, which I analyzed, the following distances were the sweet spot on the market. 100 and 200 meter backstroke and 200 meter butterfly. So, my question to you, am I done now? I've created my strategy value curve, I found the sweet spot on the market, is it just to go and compete in these distances? Am I done now? What do you think? No. Because I've just analyzed the market, but I haven't analyzed myself. What is my main value proposition according to the Osterwalder's business model canvas? As a former swimmer, I can swim all four techniques. It's not a problem for me because I used to do that and I can swim all distances, theoretically. But is it really true? I've applied another framework that is called the Vrio framework in order to find answer on that question. So when you find something that is a sweet spot on the market, you have to ask uh, yourself or your company the following four questions in order to decide if the company should go for that, should start working with that to utilize that sweet spot. First question is, is it valuable? You don't want to create something that does not create a value. 
Second question is, is it rare? You don't want to end up directly in the Red Ocean with other competitors. Third question is, can it be easily imitated? Why is it important? Because you don't want that your blue ocean becomes red directly. So you don't want to create a product that can be imitated by other competitor directly. And the last question is, is your organization capable of doing that? Because it doesn't matter even if you find a very nice sweet spot to the market, if your organization does not have a capability in doing that, you are going to fail. Coming back to that picture, what does it mean? Company strategy and strategy value curve gives direction to that fish where to jump. But companies' capabilities are fish's muscles. So if an organization does not have a capability, if fish does not have enough muscle, what will happen? It will not jump here, it will fail and jump somewhere here in between. So let's see in my case, 200 meter butterfly. Does it create value? Yes, it leads to a medal. No one is investing in that discipline. Is it rare? Sorry. Ah. Yes. Can it be easily imitated? No, without tough training, it's really difficult to swim 200 meter fly. Am I capable of doing that? Unfortunately not. Without hard training, it's really difficult to swim 200 meter butterfly. So I eliminated this discipline. 200 meter backstroke. That, is it valuable? Yes. Rare? Yes. Can it be easily imitated? No. Am I capable of doing that? Yes, I will go for that. The same goes for 100 meter backstroke. So now I have chosen that I'm going to compete in 100 and 200 meter backstroke. But how should I organize my training? How should I train for that competition? I've applied the SWOFT analysis in order to find the answer on that question. So I've analyzed myself in order to find my strengths, weaknesses and threats. What is my strength? I'm a former swimmer. For me, it's very easy to compete. I know how the competition goes. What is my weakness? It's that backstroke turn. It has changed a lot during the last 27 years. When I was a child, you were swimming just like that backstroke, hit the wall and turn. But nowadays, you are swimming backstroke and one stroke before you hit the wall, you have to turn on the stomach and create a half flip turn. And I'm not very good at that. So it's really my weakness. What are the threats on the market? That maybe there are some other smart girls performing the same market analysis. So I've decided to organize my weekly training, not on trying to be in the best possible shape, but on practicing terms. And now we are approaching the last uh, step in my strategy. It's not part of the Blue Ocean strategy, but it's part of my life philosophy. And I call it for minimum viable effort. So every time in life, if I set some professional or personal goal, I'm thinking I'm here and here's the goal which I want to achieve. What is the minimum effort which I should invest in order to reach my goal? Because I don't want to waste unnecessary energy. And I was thinking, what was the most important in order to get a medal? To train hard? No, the market analysis showed that my time was good enough for a medal. So it was very important not to get disqualified, because if I get disqualified, I'm not going to get a medal. So the main focus in my strategy was on practicing turns. So I focus on practicing turns instead of training hard. I did like that and then I competed at the Swedish National Championships for Master Swimmers. How did it go? What do you think? Did I get any return of investment? Yes, I got my medals. And I was so happy because I managed to link innovation to a value. And that's very important. 
you should not innovate just for the innovation's sake, because now it's so trendy, everyone is innovating. Your innovation should create a value. So you have to link innovation to a value. And don't forget, that sweet spot on the market is moving and shrinking all the time, because the market is changing all the time. So before each next competition, you have to apply the same market analysis. And then I did that because I was happy with my swimming in the blue ocean strategy. So for another competition, I applied that analysis. And do you know what I found out? Another time I could swim in the red ocean. I could swim at my breaststroke distances. Just a second. Do you know why? Because I saw that I was one stroke ahead of the competition. So when I analyzed the results uh, or starting list, I saw that my time was better than the other breaststroke swimmers. And that's the message. You don't have to search for blue oceans all the time. You can stay in your red ocean if you're really, really sure that you are one or two strokes ahead of the competition. But you know, for many companies, they cannot be sure. It's not usually the case. Sorry, we have one question. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, please uh, come here so that people can hear you. I come from France to join this meeting. My name is Diana, and um, I'm project manager, uh, but ex swimmer as well. And I was very inspired by your um, talk about swimming in a blue ocean during a uh, uh, Agile Lean Europe conference and I tried to apply uh, this on my case and I said maybe uh, if I do the same analysis maybe I can if I start competing again maybe I can win the medal but unfortunately after doing the analysis I discovered that in France there is no blue ocean in swimming <laughs> for my age well apart from the ocean <laughs> Thing. So, yeah, this is red ocean all around. So, do you have any advice? That's really a very good question. Do you have any idea how we can help Tiana to find her blue ocean in France? Yes, please. Is there an equivalent of the uh, middle distance where other people are choosing not to compete? Uh, I think yes, there, there, are, there is a little bit less competition in uh, middle distances, but in France anyway, they love to swing, so there are too many people with a, too good results. <laughs> so without very <coughs> hard training, uh, it's, it's not too good. So it could be part of the strategy? It could be a part, yeah. The strategy definitely works, the analysis works, but the results are not the same in the street. Yes, can you practice in France and then compete in a different country? That's <laughs> a good idea, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Uh, well, actually, I thought about it. Enjoy being out, but then we can become a <laughs> 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 Do you have any other idea? I guess, look beyond swimming. <laughs> yeah, so just compete in a different sport. Find. Uh, Emotion in a different sport that you are good at. It's good enough to compete. Mm -hmm. It can be a possibility, but uh, the thing is, she is a former swimmer, so she would like to use her capability in being a good swimmer. If she starts with a new sport, maybe she is not equally good. She doesn't have that unfair advantage as she has in swimming. So, and that's really problematic because. Each blue ocean that you find, eventually it will get red. And at first it starts getting red, and then your blue ocean is completely red. And what to do in such a situation? Let's take a look at the innovation from another perspective. When you innovate within the same domain, it results in directional or incremental innovation. So if you innovate what I was trying to do, like within swimming and different uh, distances that are officially a competition, and usually you get, you get that linear growth of ideas. But there is another more powerful way to 
innovate. It's called intersectional innovation. When you try to combine two different domains, completely different domains, and combine them in a new way. Or maybe you apply concept from one domain into another domain. Usually, you, in that way, you get exponential growth of ideas because you have a much more combinations to try. Let's see some examples of intersectional innovation that you probably recognize from your li life. Dawkins, selfish gene, mimetic theory. How did he get? He combined genetic evolution ideas with cultural behavior. Many of you are coming from software development side. How did we get design patterns, GAG on 4? They applied the principles for building houses and cities on software development, and it resulted in a very famous Gang of Four design patterns. We also have a swarm intelligence when biological systems and how ants are communicating with each other, it's that decentralized, self-organizing way how they are sending signals via producing these hormones. With computer science, it resulted in a swarm intelligence. And it's used by airplanes, how they're signaling when they're in, a, uh, in the sky, between the distance between each other. And also, a Serbian physicist, Mikhailo Pupin, he found Pupin coils that are still using in telephony. He applied Lagrange theorem on telephone lines. So we have a lot of examples of uh, intersectional innovation. Also, lean software development. How did it come? We applied principles for lean production from Toyota on software development. So intersectional innovation is a very powerful way to innovate because you have a much more ideas to test and hopefully you will find something that is new. Let's see in my case, as Tiana said. So I could get my medals here because I decided not to compete in breaststroke, but I could swim other distances. But it doesn't work in France. What to do? Andrew was a little bit guessing in that way. So maybe you can introduce some new sport combined with swimming. For example, running. So you introduce a new, create a new factor that is something else. Unfortunately, now we have that swim run that became very popular. And you see also, it was intersectional innovation. Intersectional innovation. Swim run is now very popular and opened a completely new market for sport, sport equipment, for sport uh, competitions, and so on. It's also a very good example of intersectional innovation when you innovate two different domains. So what I'm planning to do in Sweden, maybe Tiana can apply that in France, since now I cannot combine swimming with uh, running, but I would like to combine swimming with something, I'm going to combine swimming with the uh, air gun sports shooting. No one combined those two disciplines. And we have a very good place at our country house uh, where we have one official club for uh, sports uh, air gun shooting. So then I got the idea, maybe I can combine that. I checked on the internet, no one combined that. And its name in Swedish, Sim Schitte. So you can establish, introduce a new sport as you introduced, uh, as the swim run was introduced. Here is another example, not only from my personal story, but other people, other companies who use this blue ocean strategy and found something new, blue ocean. It's strategy value curve for Cirque du Soleil. You've heard about that uh, Cirque. They introduced completely new concept for circuses. Here with the red lines, it's a strategy value curves of their competitors. They were investing a lot in those animal shows, uh, multiple show arenas, uh, thrills and danger and so on. What Cirque du Soleil did? They eliminated all these factors that other circuses were investing in, decided what to reduce, raise, and then they create something new. That they always have a completely new venue, that they have a team, uh, multiple productions, artistic music, and dance. 
and then they got a new value curve. And now they're unique in the world with the day concept. And it's kind of like when you are deciding what to create, you can take a look uh, and innovate by directional innovation, if it is possible, as I did with my swimming competitions. But you, if you feel everything is just red in your market, then you create something completely new, introduce some new concept, and then get uh, something like that. What is here very important to understand? It's not only focus on introducing something new. If you just introduce something new, but don't eliminate existing things that you are doing, it's going to result in a very high cost. So that's why it's important that you eliminate and reduce these factors that everyone is doing. It's just red ocean and cost you as a company. And then, of course, you create something new, but then, although here cost, here you reduced the costs. And it's presented here on the, that now we are going too much to the business strategies, but in traditional way, you have that differentiation or low cost. So companies decide if they want to do something different, but usually it's followed by high, high cost, or they are low cost companies, but then they're not crea creating high value for their buyers. By applying Blue Ocean Strategy and the four action framework with eliminating, reducing, creating, raising, you manage to achieve both differentiation and low cost. And I think it's really very applicable on many domains, not only from the company's perspective to decide which pr products you are going to do, also when you decide to change processes, always create a, a strategy canvas see what is the current state, what you can achieve, and then apply that, eliminate, reduce, create, and raise. And you see how you can tweak that, and how you can manage to do something differently, keeping the low cost. And also what is interesting with that, uh, when you create something completely new, and uh, also with that intersectional innovation, maybe you're going to open a new tier of the customers. So when you're in a red ocean, if you are just innovating and trying to please your customers more and more, you're in fact all the time uh, fighting for the same customers against your competitors. And, and uh, that old uh, mantra is we used to say customer first. For blue ocean strategists, they say non-customer first. So it's one tool which helps you to uh, uh, where to look what new you can introduce in your product, in things in your offering that you are doing, in order to create a new blue ocean. And then you analyze customers and non-customers. Current market, you have a cu current customers. But then you would like to see soon-to-be customers. Maybe there is a group of customers who are sitting on the edge of your industry and have already started considering maybe they should use your product but for some reason, they're not using that. Maybe you can introduce that reason and open that new tier of customers. So, and they defined three different tier of no customers where you can take a look. So Blue Ocean Strategy had a lot of very powerful tools which you can use in order to know where to search for a blue ocean, where to search for new competing factors that you can introduce and create. Here is another example of a blue ocean strategy. It's uh, applied for Citizen M Hotel. And uh, it's very nice because now I'm staying at Citizen M Hotel next to the London Tower. So I'm very happy that I'm staying at the Blue Ocean Hotel now when I'm presenting and talking about the Blue Ocean strategy. It's another example because you can say, OK, if I create strategy value curves for my competitors, Maybe I get uh, some uh, graph that not all uh, curves converge in the same way as I got for the swimming. What people from Citizen M did? They realized that there are several strateg different strategic groups, but they are not competing against each other. You have uh, one strategic group for luxury hotels, 
and usually luxury hotels are competing against other luxury hotels and it's presented here with that black curve. They have a high of offering for everything, to build a very nice hotels, to have a very nice lobby and so on. And, uh, and then they took a look at the three star hotels and it's that red curve. And they're investing a little bit less in all those things. And they were thinking, maybe we can combine these two strategic different groups and create a new market for both customers. And they did a lot of interviews with people to understand why people is choosing a luxury five stars hotel and why they are choosing three stars hotel. And they realized mostly reason was like for choosing luxury hotels was a good location and a, a nice feeling in the room. But some things like a big, a nice lobby, people who are working there, they didn't experience that as a valuable thing. So they combine those two things and get this, that blue value curve. They eliminated all those first things, like you don't have to have a big, a nice lobby. You don't have to have people to help you with your baggage because most people are traveling just uh, with uh, one uh, small suitcase or when you're on a business trip, usually you don't have a lot of a luggage and so on. So when they analyzed what their customers and non-customers thought, they introduced a new concept and creating some new factors like, you know, when you enter Citizen M Hotel, there is no reception. There are just those um, uh, desks, machines, where you can check in, like at the airport. So it saves your time. You have one person who is standing there and help if you need the help. But instead of waiting a long queue to check in, you are done in uh, one minute, and so on. So, uh, so there are many ways how you can find your blue ocean. And now it's a last comment regarding the innovation. So it's not uh, everything uh, that I presented today. Everything does not come from the blue ocean strategy, but I combine some principles how I see on that and how I find that useful. You've heard a lot of times disruptive innovation. Isn't it like that? Every time when you talk about innovation, people are saying oh, disruptive innovation, disruptive innovation. But in fact, innovation does not have to be disruptive. I agree, disruptive innovation is very good. And there are two types of disruptive innovation. One is called creative destruction. It's when superior technology comes on the market and replaces uh, the existing one directly. It happened with the uh, digital photography. There is another type that is called disruptive innovation when inferior technology enters the market as a try on horse, but during the time develops to superior technology and replace the market leaders. It happened with that uh, uh, producers of the hard disk drive. But you also have non-disruptive innovation. And it's like when you in identify something, a new need on the market and solve completely new pro problem. For example, profession coaching, life coaching, agile coaching. It didn't exist for 15, 20 years ago. It didn't disrupt anything. Now it's the fastest, goes, uh, fastest growing profession in the world, coaching in many areas. And it's a good example of a non-disruptive innovation. It's also a way how I see on that intersectional innovation and a blue ocean strategy to disrupt it's great, but it's not easy, and usually it takes time. But our chance for our, us simple people who are trying to innovate something, it lies in a non-disruptive innovation, in a blue ocean strategy, and intersectional innovation. So I'm going to wrap up this talk by this nice blue-red ocean strategy comic created by one of my sons, Simon. He was nine years old when he did that. He got inspired by my Swimming in the Blue Ocean story and created this uh, comic. Let's see what happens here. So there are two swimming pools. One is Red Ocean Swimming Pool with a lot of swimmers inside and the Blue Ocean Swimming Pool with just several swimmers inside. And there are two guys next to the swimming pools talking to each other. And the first one is coming and saying, oh, I'm going to swim in the Red Ocean Pool. 
But the second guy is saying, oh, but wait, it seems that he has another mindset. And the first guy is a little bit surprised. And then he says, why? Why should I wait? And he said, because there are so many people in the red ocean. And he said, OK, and what's wrong with that? And he says, people usually believe that they're good at red ocean and trying to create the best product and compete against other, and it costs a lot. But it's much better to shift focus from competing to creating something new to create a new factor, a new blue ocean. So blue oceans ahead. If you want to learn more about blue oceans, uh, the authors, Rene Maborn and Chan Kim, published the Blue Ocean Strategy book. I think it was published 10 years ago. So, and there is description much more about uh, that mindset and how to, it's better to create something than to compete against each other. So it's much more how to find this fishbowl. Now in September, they published a new excellent book that is called Blue Ocean Shift. How you as an organization can find that path and do that jump to your blue ocean. So I presented today just some of their tools that they are suggested, suggested how you can search and where you can search for new blue oceans, how you can analyze the market, and yourself as a company. And also, if you're interested in reading more about the intersectional innovation, there is a very good book which inspired me a lot called, called The Medici Effect. So, I hope that I will be swimming in my blue ocean once again. And I hope that you are going to create your blue oceans. Thank you for your attention. So, do we have uh, more questions? Uh, can you tell us a bit about the process to identify the factors? Sorry, I was asking about the, you can tell us a bit about the process, how do you identify the factors, but because those can be pretty much anything, depending on how you look at the your competition, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's a very good question, because uh, I really recommend that when, if you are inspired and start doing that, start first with a strategy can canvas to see where your competitors are and where you are. Choosing competing factors is really very tricky because uh, it's just your perspective on the industry and yourself as an organization. So there is no complete truth that for the chosen competing factor that you are really right. So there is also risk that you create strategy canvas in the wrong way. You choose some competing factors and think, oh, we are co doing completely differently, but your customers and the industry does not see on you that. There is no very, any good answers, but what is good and what we are doing at my company, and uh, when I talk to other people who are also using that blue ocean strategy approach, what they are doing. It's good to have uh, different perspectives. So maybe you can have uh, in your organization different groups of people combined so that they work together and create this strategy canvas. And then you see, like, do we have the same perspective on our industry and business or not? And also to ask your customers to help you to ask them, like in surveys or interviews, what do you see? What are the most important competing factors for our industry in order to get inspired? And uh, I can say also my personal comment. To choose the right competing factors, you have to be a good expert within that domain. But on the other side, when you're a really good expert, your expertise constrains you in finding intersectional things, you know. Because you are so focused on your industry and you think, oh, maybe we can improve this, introduce this, but then you, you, you lose a little bit that of a macro perspective. But I would say, start first, I think Strategy Canvas is such a good visualization tool just to see what is the current state before you start to search for a blue ocean and trying to perform that workshop with the different groups and different people, both coming from development, product management, senior management, communication, marketing, so that you get more perspectives. And it will be ideal also to involve your customers, how they see on industry. Yes, please. Yeah. I was just going to say an answer to that. 
the things that are going through my mind about uh, creating a strategy canvas is looking at um, the reports and research that come out from the big consultancies on that particular industry that you're looking into. Um, and also if um, there are companies within that industry that are quoted on the stock market, then I look at the financial analyst reports and the things that they comment on because they have a very different perspective. They look from a very financial perspective at the factors of the company that they think are important when they're comparing the industry. So they have a view. I think the consultancies have a view when they put out a view of the industry. And I think those are all interesting factors of things that they... So if I look at the hotel one that you did, mm -hmm. that looked particularly at the factors um, from the customer, uh, very much from the customer experience, what features yes, are yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. If I widen that out to some of the things that um, an industry report on the hotel industry would have included, there would have been a wider range of factors in there which would have expanded on things like um, location and would have expanded on a lot more sort of factors on the features that are available. So that's what, I don't know if that helps, but it's what's going through my mind because I'm going to go and do one of these tomorrow morning. So it's definitely on my mind. <laughs> ah, okay, great. <laughs> So the question I have is uh, related to, to the example you provided. Uh, you choose to swim in the, I would say, bluish ocean because you know there is an ocean in there. You chose the breaststroke, you analyze the market, but you knew there are medals in there. But the other example you gave, which was for circus, they didn't know if there is an ocean in there, there might be blue desert. So could you tell more about you know, innovating and how you actually figure out if there is a customer at the other end of this journey? Uh, <laughs> it's a very good and a difficult question. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, all tools proposed and market analysis help you, but of course you have to be innovative in order to find something new. But uh, uh, my expertise is not uh, business strategy, is uh, software development. So uh, I would say that uh, may maybe they did, when uh, Cirque du Soleil introduced that, maybe they did also similar research as uh, Citizen M, try to ask people and try to think what, which things could entertain people and uh, but I don't know, unfortunately, exactly how they did, how they uh, performed that. If I may just uh, add here, maybe the data analysis would factor what people dislike to get their ideas. Yes, I mean, the opposite. Yeah, I guess they to support that with more kind of product research, you know, thinking. Uh, so, maybe another question, how does it help you as a head of development? How does this help you in, in professional life? Um, I, uh, one thing is uh, that I have started uh, driving, uh, doing that blue ocean strategy exercises with the senior management. So we are a group of people like head of development and then head of product uh, owners, uh, communication strategy, it's much more like uh, uh, maybe I don't apply that directly on my everyday work, but in order to be sure that my product will create a value and create a revenue for the company, currently I'm in, uh, currently I'm in a gaming business and it seems that it's red ocean all over the place because people, uh, gaming companies are producing the same type of uh, games. So, so it's much more from the perspective like product development and also as Mary Popendick sa said that uh, we should be much more like focused on product development, not only projects to execute them, but to have that big picture. How um, users are using our products, does it create uh, revenue for us and so on. So it's much more from that perspective. But uh, regarding the processes, because I'm testing also with the different type of processes in my department exactly as you are doing at your everyday work. I think it's so powerful to think that eliminate, reduce, create, when you try to do something new, to think, oh, 
but we should eliminate that, otherwise you end up with a lot of things doing at the same time, and then focus also. So it's much more that I'm inspired, but maybe I haven't applied directly that I can say I applied in this way, but it's much more from the product perspective. I want that my product creates a value, and I feel now it's not creating enough value because it's a red ocean, how we can do that differently. But of course, uh, what is my uh, advantage working in development? I know the technological uh, uh, constraints and uh, 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 possibilities that come from the technological side. As I say, like a um, company has to know capability, uh, know, is aware if it's capable of doing that. And then from the development department, you know, maybe, you know, sometimes product managers, product owners are coming with the great ideas, but you know that the value that you're going to invest in creating that is going to be much higher than the value that you're going to receive that. So, so, so it's, um, that's why it's your advantage to work in development and be aware about those things. Hmm? Um, just following on from that, um, do you find that with your, uh, your peers in the company that um, you're effectively, um, I suppose it's easier for you to um, push them the eliminate, as in these things are technically complex to do or take time to do, and therefore challenge the value of those. Um, and perhaps it's, it's harder for you to say, um, here is the ability to create something that your other peers don't have because of the fact that you can't compare yourself as easily to their, and you can connect it around their capability. Um, so do you find that it's, um, that your, your sales, your marketing, your, your products, um, peers find it challenging that you're basically the person that says, or potentially says no quite a lot? Mm. Um, the answer is, first I think it's good when you present what you are going to eliminate, not to present just new things that you are going to create, because everyone see oh, it's a lot of cost. Now I haven't presented all uh, proposed uh, exercises, what you should do in order to find um, Blue Ocean. One of the exercises is mapping your offerings. Uh, there is a map that is called the uh, Settler Migrator Pioneer Map to map all your products and offerings, like if they are already settlers on the market, have existing for a long time. Migrators are something that is, you are innovating, but it's not completely venue innovation. And pioneers are really good candidate for blue ocean. But it's not only how you map your offerings, you uh, map them and uh, write the size of revenue that it creates. So, of course, you don't want to remove something that is maybe settler, has been existing on the market long time, if it creates a big revenue for your company. But usually you find some things that you have some products and offerings that cost a lot, but does not create a lot of value anymore. So it's good, but uh, I think they, they, they buy the idea when you really have done the whole analysis, when, you, when they saw that you really thought about all things, not to just remove and eliminate. And of course, people are not so positive just uh, taking away existing things. But uh, it's also, it's good that you ask that question because it's really very important here, as I said, and I'm going to repeat, not to focus only on creating something new, but also and eliminating and reducing things. So to find the, the right, right balance. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, personally, um, I, I've sort of seen firsthand um, over the last, last five years that um, it's really hard for companies to balance um, somewhere in the middle between utility and, and, and surplus and feature sets. Um, quite often people are going for surplus features at all times and you know, they're not going in that happy balance mm -hmm. in, in the centre. And uh, I would add also people have to change also it's a mindset question because uh, with my swimming competitions I have a lot of master swimmers and they're swimming their distances and really competing in a tough area. And they said, but why not to try to swim these distances? No, they don't want, they, they want to stay in the red ocean, even if they don't get a medal. So I think it's also a mindset that you have to change uh, from that competing, we have to have the best product uh, be first on the market to change that mindset. It's also uh, <laughs> requires time and energy how to change people's mindset to think in that way. I think that's a good idea, but I'm not sure that all people think the same.
Very inspiring talk. Uh, I think what everybody understands there's a blue blue ocean, then probably they will jump onto it and that will become a red ocean. Um, my question is about uh, the minimum viable effort that you mentioned around the end of your. Yes, it's my invention. <laughs> it's not part of the blue ocean strategy, yes, please. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just thinking what you're just describing over here. It sounded more like minimum viable objective, like a minimum viable product that you hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. this. Um, because sprint-based uh, agile systems, people use a term like to define what is the minimum objective you achieve within a given period of time. Uh, can you please elaborate on that? Mm. I would say that uh, ah, it was my invention because I thought it's nice. Now everything is minimum viable, so that's why I wanted to introduce that minimum viable effort because it's really how I think. But I think it's much more related to that focus that you should focus only on one thing and then it's a bigger chance that you are achieve than if you are investing in a lot of things. I could have said also with my strategy, now I'm going to compete and trade hard board for breaststroke distances and from other distances. But then it would cost me too much, you know. So I think that minimum viable effort is much more way to explain that you should really have a good focus only on one thing. But, but of course, it's not easy to see what is the most critical thing and most important thing in, in your strategy. But I believe if you have only one focus, it's a bigger chance that you are going to succeed. Absolutely. I mean, so it is more to do with objective and then deciding what sort of effort you would need to achieve that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And then now I remember also one question uh, regarding competing factors. Although it's difficult and it's relative how you choose them, I know. I'm uh, in one book circle connected uh, to people from all over the world who applied blue ocean strategies at their work. Everybody said, when you start doing that strategy canvas, although you think it's difficult to choose the right competing factors, but it's so powerful visualization tool because very soon you see that a lot of things that you're doing, it's me too products. So, so although maybe even if you are not completely sure that your competing factors are 100% correct, that tool helps you a lot just to open your eyes and to see where is your position on the market. And uh, also one comment, when you create that uh, canvas, when you have chosen your first, you create a list of competing factors, different teams, and then you agree upon them. Please group them in a way that you can then have uh, eliminate, reduce, raise, create. Otherwise, you can get a like, zigzag curve, and then you cannot see anything from that. So it's just one advice if you're doing that. Hmm? More questions? Yes, please. On the uh, minimum viable effort, I'm wondering if a way of looking at it is um, maximizing return on investment. Yes, yes, you, you can say so. What is the, yes, yes, I agree. It's a different way how you can describe the same thing. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but, uh, it is different and also it brings in the uh, concept that other managers can understand. Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, I, I've tried doing something like minimum viable effort and it, it tends to not quite work, whereas ROI uh, is positive. It's, um, and it's simply to focus on the positive results and then secondarily reducing the input. That's Yes, yes, I agree. It can be more like a psychological yeah. <laughs> thing okay. that it's better to say. Mm? I agree. Mm? There, um, there are two things that I'm wondering about. One, on a personal level, I like the idea. I struggle with it. So I like the idea of minimum viable effort and just stopping and thinking up front. How much should I put into this? So I'm going to try and apply that in my life. So I'm oh, like, okay, great. <laughs> um, 
but on, on the minimum viable effort in a, in a context, I think sometimes ROI and VP, they get used so much, they're almost not very emotive terms, but I'm, I'm wondering when you use them, do you, um, do, you, do you actually try and quantify what the effort would be, and do you do that in time or money, or does it vary, how do you, how do you actually use that in your discussions? Does that make sense, the question? Yes, yes, I understand. I think it's, uh, maybe I will put the, what is the more efficient way to achieve something? So, so, so maybe it's not a good name, that effort, but what will be like, usually if you want to achieve something, you have uh, several choices how you get there. But it's like, what is the most efficient way and also less time consuming or does not, because also with that practicing turns, it cost me less than training hard. I wasn't so tired, you know, just practicing turns. But it's much more like what is the most efficient way to, and also to focus on one thing and eliminate things which does not contribute. Because uh, I got some time on that swimming competition. Uh, if I had uh, trained more, I would have got better time. But for me, it was like when I saw my time is enough for a gold medal, I'm not going to aim to get even better time. It's so, from that perspective. So, there's a need to have a lot of clarity on what you're trying to get. Yes, to. yes. Otherwise, you're, yeah, you could go all over the place. Yes. You knew where you needed to get to. But okay, yeah. Yes. Helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. So, um, when you happen to be already in some kind of blue ocean, <laughs> but um, you like basically have to go with the flow, how do you maintain a focus on innovation? How do you how do you maintain that effort? Basically, if people find a sweet a sweet spot at a certain given point in time. How do you maintain that mentality? Mm. Uh, there is one. Um, I don't know if you heard. It's uh, I think a McKinsey model for. Horizon one, two, and three. It said horizon one is where your company is right now. And you have some business operational model, what is your main value proposition, channels, customers, and so on. At the same time, even if it is going good for your company, as you say, maybe you are now in a blue ocean, but every blue ocean will get red, unfortunately, sometime in the future, or it's a big probability. You have, at the same time, work on horizon two, what will happen like in a one, two or three years and innovate your business operational model. So maybe you don't have to change too much, but a little bit innovate. And then horizon three, what will happen in three or five years. And uh, there is a chances for finding a new blue ocean. And uh, it's called usually you are going to completely change or disrupt your business operational model. And it's also recommended that the amount of time that you are spending now on strategy work, it should be like 70% spent for Horizon 1, but at the same time 20% for Horizon 2 and 10% for Horizon 3. And it's a very good question because many, company, when, many companies, when they find, oh, we are in blue ocean or we are three strokes ahead of the competition, they just enjoy and they are not planning what they are going to do in the future. And when they realize now we are getting, we are in the red ocean, it's too late to start working on that, what will happen in the future. So one thing is uh, like to start thinking already now what you are going to do in Horizon 2 in two years, what will be in Horizon 3 in three to four years. And to start maybe doing these exercises to explore what are possibilities for the future. So, and also, at many companies to have a good innovation process in place, innovation flow, that uh, you have uh, such structures that uh, you are organizing uh, hackathons, innovation weeks, uh, innovation uh, events. At my company in Atent, we really are very good at that. We have each month, we have uh, 24 hours completely dedicated for some innovation project. So team can gather self-organizing teams from different departments. And it's also something important to increase that intersectional innovation, to have people who are taking a look at things from different perspectives. Then you have a bit bigger chance to innovate. And then we are also organizing Innovation Week, but not only those things. We have a innovation 
flow, innovation backlog, and we are trying some of those ideas uh, to prototype and uh, to see. So I think it's important to work from that inno with innovation, even if it is going very well from the company, even if you feel that now we are in a blue ocean. Don't relax. <laughs> Sharks are on their way. So hmm? I hope that you get the answer to my question. <laughs>